Alrighty. Are you all ready? Can I get thumbs up? All right, I see a lot of thumbs up. So good morning, everyone. My name is Giovanni Estrada, and I'm with the International We Love You Foundation. We are so excited that you all were able to join us yesterday and also for now day two. Yesterday, we had an amazing speaker. Her name was Emily Surmont, and she worked with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Today, we have another amazing speaker, and we're so excited to bring you this week. Again, this week is Earth Week. This month is Earth Month, and Friday is Earth Day. The theme of this whole week is invest in our planet. So why would we want to invest in our planet? It's because you all are the future. So you and I and all the adults and all the children, everyone here in this world has a responsibility to take care of this world. So we can do this together, just with little simple steps. So this week we have for you all people who work in local government offices, even professors who dedicate their whole life in making an impact. And we hope we can inspire you all so that you can all do the same. We could have not done this without our sponsors and also our partners. So a huge shout out to Junior Achievement, who focuses, who focuses on the three pillars. And also, uh, in addition to that, our sponsors, Hayward and Waste Management, and us as the International We Love You Foundation, we focus on making an impact through a mother's love all over the world. We are associated with the United Nations Department of Global Communications. But without further ado, again, we wanna say thank you all so much and we want to introduce our first speaker. But before we get there, I want to show you one more thing. This right here is an amazing template that Junior Achievement put together. So if you don't have this template, please take out a notebook and write down any notes you have. So this template has a little biography of our, first spe of our speaker for the day. You're going to be able to take some notes of some interesting facts, and you can write down some questions. And throughout the program, please feel free to submit any questions because at the end of the session, we're gonna have a Q&A session. So again, thank you all to the schools joining from Palm Beach County and Treasure Coast. We're so honored you're able to join us. So now for our speaker. So let's introduce her. Round of applause for Dr. Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher has over 30 years of experience in the marine research uh, field as well. And she's also a Fulbright scholar and was able to travel to Central America. She's also a lecturer at the University of Miami and now is a program director for Fabian Ocean Learning Center. Dr. Fletcher, we are all excited to hear about your journey, so please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Gio, to the We Love You International We Love You Foundation and also to JA, Junior Achievement, and all of the sponsors for this event. So good morning, everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you today to talk to you about my journey through where, well, really how I've ended up where I am today from when I was probably your age. I know there were a couple of schools that had registered, so shout out to you. I hope you're having a great morning and great Earth Week. Please do take notes and let me know if you have any questions as they relate to my presentation or something that you're thinking about that might relate to some of the research that I'll share with you. I'm going to go through my introduction, my career journey, and how what we're doing today relates to the environment, successes and failures that led to important lessons learned for me throughout my career and advice to young people, because you are the next generation of ocean stewards and environmental advocates. So for me, my journey started when I was a little girl. I did not spend a lot of time at the ocean, but I did occasionally go there on vacations and I fell in love with this amazing environment. I grew up in New England, which is comprised of the states up in the Northeast, so Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and I worked in the field with fisheries, lobster, shellfish, all of these different critters that we find in those cold waters. And today, I'll show you that journey of how I ended up being the program director for the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center and teaching as a professor at the University of Miami. Talking about education, because some of you are high school students, I know some of the younger students may not be thinking about university or college yet, but it's an important step in how I got to where I am today. 
So my undergrad degree, which means once you get all the way through high school, where do you go next? I went to the University of Rhode Island and I was able to study not only fish, but also policy, those laws and regulations that allow us to have fisheries regulations. After that, I went to uh, an engineering, more of an environmental engineering master's degree, and I completed my doctoral degree, so even more school after that, but in soil and water science, something very, very different that I really never thought that I would have pursued when I first started out in this career. Why would I study soils? So this might be a good question for you to put notes down. How did I end up studying soils if I had this deep passion for the marine field? I really never thought I would. However, there are many connections. And for those of you in school here in South Florida, whether you grew up here or you moved here, I'm sure that you'll be able to make this connection as well. So I did find that many of my colleagues, so these are the people that I was working with, had an interest in the land-sea connection. And although I had studied many years all about the ocean environment, I did not want to be in the uplands in fresh water, but I, I learned by doing that there is a really strong connection and what we do on land actually affects us and what we see on those reef ecosystems right offshore. With making that land sea connection, I'll ask you to take a look at the lower left of this slide. There's an image of Everglades restoration work. And so the natural flow of water from the central part of the state, if you look at the center picture, you can see Lake Okeechobee. We know that water flows out of Lake Okeechobee and typically would run down into the Florida Bay, the southern tip of the peninsula of Florida. This is how water connects us all, and the soil and water. So the water is moving through that soil. And for the older students, if you're looking at any sort of research articles, there's a wonderful document that really outlines some of the policy, so the laws and regulations, in addition to some of the science that supports why we are so connected. So I'm sure many of you have heard about Everglades restoration. I hope you've visited the Everglades and that you can see how soil and water science relate to the marine and coastal environment. I was very involved in teaching other people to get excited, hopefully, about water and its relationship to the marine and coastal environment. I helped develop workshops, training sessions, and I wrote a lot. So if you don't like writing right now in school, it's very important to be able to take ideas and science and put that into documents, whether it's a book, to train other people to learn about water or soil or corals, but to get that information out into the hands of whether it's a decision maker, so maybe one of your commissioners or your mayors, or somebody who's just interested in the topic. When I was in college, I also worked with several individuals from agriculture in South Florida, it up in Palm Beach County more so than where I am here in Broward and where I spend my time in Miami-Dade and Monroe counties, I learned about agriculture as a really big industry, so taking up a lot of space and its importance to the economy in addition to the environment here in South Florida. So many of my Colleagues from the University of Florida were working in this arena and we started to share information and some of them actually had marine science degrees or interests as well. So we had a lot of conversations about the linkage between the land and the sea. The take home message here is that I study soil and I study water and I study coral reefs. So all of this is connected because we are connected in South Florida to our environment. I do work in Central America, as Gio had mentioned, and we also look at from the mountaintops, where this is a picture on the left-hand side, that's a coffee farm, and we make the connection all the way down to the shoreline. I study sea turtles with a group of individuals that live and uh, manage our sea turtle program in Nicaragua, and we talk about the sediment and the soils, how they relate to sea turtles and what we find with the color of the soil, with the moisture of the soil. So again, another example from another place on the globe about how we are connected through soil, water, and the marine environment. 
If any of you have had the chance to see some of the sea turtles nesting, I find that it's magical both to see the mothers laying their nests in addition to seeing all those little hatchlings come out of the sand when they're ready to go out to sea. And these instruments on the right hand side, I don't know if some of you have laboratories in your schools, but this is a shaker which we put the sediment into these shakers and we start to see the different sizes of the sand grains. And at the top here, this is a temperature logger. So we are studying the temperatures in addition to the size of those grains, the color of the sediment, and that affects, I don't know if you guys have heard this, we have the hot chicks and the cool guys to determine the sex of our sea turtles. Moving back into my education and some of my earlier experiences, I wanted to bring in something very, very different than the field work, which gets me very excited, but to also talk about some of those unique positions that I've held in the past. And one of them was as an environmental engineer with the electric boat. Um, it's a part of the, it's called General Dynamics, but it is an organization that builds nuclear submarines. And so for some time I was involved in developing green submarines. This relates to the way in which submarines are built. One great example is instead of using paint where you actually put the paint on the side of the submarine, electrostatic painting would reduce waste as the ships were being built so that the paint was electrically static. Um, it's called electrostatic painting and it would stick to the side of the submarine. So we were reducing the amount of waste as we build these submarines. Another really interesting and different aspect of career um, or positions that I've held was with environmental permitting. And what you see here is a cable ship. 99% of communications are through submarine fiber optic cables. What is that? That is a cable that is laid across the ocean. In this image at the top, you can see all of the cables that are, it's a little bit light. We can come back to this when we do the Q&A if you want to take a closer look at it but lots of cables are all around the globe on the sea floor, and we really need to pay attention to where those cables are laid so that we're not impacting the environment. And so many neat toys you can see in this middle image. Here's a, an ROV, and I'm at the helm here, remotely operated vehicles. So for those of you who are involved in any of the ROV competitions, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And on the right-hand side, here's one of the vessels, a big ship, that goes out and puts the cable out, um, for example, from the east coast of Florida all the way over to Europe. Really fascinating. But I was living in New England. You remember that up in the Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. And I went to go on a uh, trip to collect little tropical fish for the New England Aquarium out of Boston. And I was able to spend two weeks living on a boat owned by the Shedd Aquarium, so they are out of Chicago, and collected fish and saw that there are these tropical warm waters after working in Long Island Sound, which is cold with the shellfish and the lobsters that can pinch you, and decided that this was the place that I wanted to work. So I asked you, if you wanted to be a marine scientist, where would you actually want to live and be in the water? I think the right-hand side is where I would like to be. So I ended up moving to Florida and working for the state. And this was a project that was absolutely amazing because I got to travel around the entire state of Florida and see the different habitats and the ways in which we manage the coastal environment. From there, I decided I wanted to go even further south and I ended up working down in the Florida Keys with the Marine Resources Department involved in many, many different field studies in addition to policy and regulation. So related very much so to my degrees. And then I came back north. I moved a little bit north to Broward County, worked for their marine resources. Again, expanding my knowledge and also experience. I wanted to spend more time in the field and in Broward County at the time, we were doing a lot of field work. So I was in the water, I would say, probably several times a month and was able to learn, improve my scuba diving skills in addition to data analysis and also some policy recommendations. I was offered a scholarship through the U.S. Department of State 
to go to Central America to share what I had learned, all of these different positions that you've seen that I've held, and put that information into a way in which I could work with the local individuals, these communities on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua in Central America. So my focus was coral reefs, but we also have sea turtles. And it's a unique place where there is not a lot of development. It's actually very uh, low level development. In some places there is no water, there is no electricity, and it's absolutely beautiful and the environment is just stunning. I did return to South Florida. It's my home, I call it home, and I feel as though I'm nestled in between this amazing natural resource, which we have, the Everglades, and also our reef ecosystem. So I have a city life, if I want to get the fast pace of the city, but I'm surrounded by these two amazing natural areas. When I did return, I began a position with NOAA. Most of you might be familiar with NOAA because of the National Hurricane Center. And I was working with the University of Florida as a partnership. So I was a liaison where I was working inside a NOAA laboratory doing research and trying to take that information and share it in meaningful ways to different audiences. And again, a many, many different types of projects that I was involved in, everything from being in the water, spending time on coral reefs around the Caribbean to communicating science. And what you see here is Tropical Connections. It's a book all about South Florida's marine environment. The Caribbean work that I was involved in, on the right hand side here, you can see there's an image of a buoy. This buoy is actually placed secured to the seafloor. There were several stations all around the Caribbean and it would collect data and information, satellite stream it to our laboratory in Miami and be used for different types of analysis. It's available to the public, it is now. So for those teachers interested in looking at some of these data sets, you can get those right on the NOAA website. And I also had the opportunity to return to Nicaragua through contract work. So it was amazing that you just never know in life how things can come full circle. I did mention communicating science, and this is so important. You have wonderful world-class science, and you need to get it into the hands of the people who can use it. So whether they're teachers or they're decision makers, policy makers, or other researchers, really being able to share that information with one another is very important. I did learn through being a guest speaker in classrooms and interacting on several different projects that I love teaching. And so I did end up moving into the teaching field and worked at a few different institutions. And it's really now how I've evolved to be the program director at the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center, in addition to teaching some classes at the University of Miami's Marine School down in Miami. So the role of what I am doing today and how it relates to the environment, I'm gonna go through a little bit of the Ocean Learning Center. We are involved with women empowerment and sea turtle conservation. We work with a team of local individuals who manage the entire project, everything from the research, the monitoring on the sea turtles, in addition to ecotourism, so they are trying to improve their lives through entrepreneurial skills, and they're also learning workforce ready skills, being able to pursue potentially STEM education degrees in the future. There's women, there's girls, we have all different types of ages involved in our project. For Coral Reef Educational Programming in Curacao, this is our second program with the Ocean Learning Center. If you see in the upper right hand side, there's this underwater international space station. And that is showing you that in the future, it's not in the water yet. The plan is to develop and place that underwater international space station off the coast of Curacao as a research laboratory. So that research in water, underwater for several days can be done, if not months. If you're not familiar with Curacao, where Curacao is located, it's off 
I'm sure I should have kept this as a question for all of you. Where is Curacao located? You can see here in the lower right hand side of the image, it's South America, so off the coast of Venezuela, if you're not familiar with where it is located. So different reef ecosystem than we have here in South Florida, but it's still a coral reef ecosystem. And that brings us to our Florida programming. So this is our third program with the Ocean Learning Center. And we have been busy with, you, you all know, we love you foundation. And we have been cleaning up mangrove forests down in the Florida Keys. We'll be up in Palm Beach County later this week. And we are very, very interested in not only removing marine debris from our natural areas, but also doing the education, trying to figure out how much debris, the type of debris, and how we can get to the refuse, reuse, reduce all of the marine plastics that we've been finding along the beach. So lots of different partnerships and programs. We're a very small program. We rely on volunteers and students like yourselves to get involved in some of our activities. And so we invite you, teachers, you are more than welcome to join us. I know we love you. We'll post some information, but a lot of our other um, collaborators are um, posting all the time the different types of cleanups in addition to restoration activities. We do a lot of native plantings. And then the final piece of what I wanted to talk to you about the roles that I play today is through education. I love bringing my students out into the field because we learn through experiential learning, right? Even this lecture, it's a little long, there's a lot of information, hopefully the pictures have kept you excited, but when we bring students out into nature or into the environment that we're, they're studying, there's a whole different connection, deeper meaning that occurs. And so that's my favorite type of classroom to have is where I'm bringing my students into the classroom and here we're down in Key Largo and we're meeting with one of the park staff. And then the next portion or the next portion of this presentation relates to successes and failures. But I like to call failures, don't like that terminology. I like to call them challenges and how I learned to adjust and to pivot. I think COVID, the pandemic, was one of those great instances where it wasn't fun for anybody, but what did we learn? We learned how to shift, adapt, just like the environment, and move on. So some of the successes and challenges that I found. Through the um, entire career that I've had, one of the foundational projects that doesn't go away, this book was produced in 2012, and I, I say it doesn't go away because it's, it's a good thing. This book has changed the way that teachers are using scientific information in their classrooms from middle school, elementary school, some teachers all the way through the university system. And this book really was intended to bring science in a way that was meaningful to a bunch of different people, so not just researchers. And I would just let all of the teachers know I do have classroom sets if you'd like to get a set of these books for your classroom, please email me after the presentation and I can go ahead and we can set up a way in which to get you a classroom set. But this was definitely one of the successes that I found. It took six years to develop, so it took a long time to make this happen and hundreds of volunteers, each of the authors, all of the people that were the photographers, design layout, it was a very big process. But one example I wanted to show you is through visualizations. People may not want to read a bunch of text, but pictures really capture a story. And so here you have an example of a coral reef back in the 1950s, and that's at the top. And then as you look down through 1988 and 1998, you see these changes to the same coral head that we were monitoring, we were looking at here in the Florida Keys. And so this is Dr. Shin, he was the one who was studying this. He's a geologist and he happened to capture these images to show people all of the changes. And do you remember soil and water? Like us all, a lot of the discussion that relates to the change in the coral reef ties to the water quality and as you know, climate change. So there's a lot of science. Uh, another example I want to bring up, because it's not as sensational as some of the corals, but is seagrass habitats. These might be habitats that people aren't necessarily interested in. I know I love them. You can scuba dive or snorkel, and you can just sit there and watch all of the little critters that are moving around within the seagrasses. But it distills, the book distills information that is quite complex in these visual 
formats. Um, all of you know that birds, right? We have lots of birds. We have a lot of seagrasses in South Florida, and there's a connection to those two things. There's several different types of seagrasses that we have. They have different nutrient requirements. I'm sure some of you in the high school level are definitely learning about nutrient requirements and what happens in the water. But this was a study where one of the researchers were look, was looking at the changes in the community. So just like plants on land, because they're easier to observe if you don't get in the water, what we were seeing was there was a shift in the types of seagrasses based on those nutrient requirements. And so somebody came up with this great idea, Dr. Jim Forkren and his laboratory based out of Florida International University. They put little bird sticks in the shallow areas and the birds would roost on those. And of course they like to eat and they go to the bathroom. So the, the birds that were living on some of these trees in addition to the bird sticks, I'll show you in a moment, but they are living in these trees, they go to the bathroom and then there's more nutrients in the water. So you start to see changes in the types of seagrasses. So while this is a complex topic in the chemistry and the water quality, I think these visualizations are one example of how you can take a very complex story and distill it into information that many of the teachers here can probably use in their classrooms to explain how excess nutrients can affect the way in which we see habitats, again, terrestrial marine, but this is our example from the marine environment. So here you have your, your, your bird stakes, and you can see the shift in the types of seagrasses found. Another success that I pride myself on is any of the programs that I've done in Nicaragua, the emphasis was always on having local people manage their own resources. So providing the support and the technology and the training to them in order for them to manage their own resources. They don't need me there, they don't need you there, they are very capable with the proper training and explanation. Also, if we look at the conservation of areas, marine areas in particular, I mentioned the really amazing pristine quality of the reefs on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. And when I went back, in um, 2014, 15, and 16, one of the things that I was very much involved in was trying to support the management of a marine protected area, a new zone for this region. So if you see the red star, it's an area that is a big square, um, in the blue solid square, if you'll call it a square for me today, that area would be a protected area and the hash lines here are a buffer zone. So to protect all of the marine resources that are within the blue square. Globally, right, we always like inspiring the next generation of ocean stewards through, so through opportunities like the International We Love You Foundation, getting information out. Here in Florida we do things, but I know the International Foundation really shares what we're doing here, if you go to their website, you see a whole bunch of information about the places they work around the globe. So if, building the next generation of ocean stewards, this is one of my classes. I've taken them down to the Florida Keys, so they're learning about the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They are right in the laboratory with some of these amazing researchers learning about Queen Conch. We've also done coral fragmentation where we're taking those corals that have been rescued from seawalls and then they get cut into smaller pieces. That's what these students are doing in this image. So they are actually cutting, um, a, I don't know, I'd say a, a salad plate size coral into smaller pieces and then they are actually put on these little, we call them plugs, put into the nursery tank that you see in the lower left hand corner and they are grown for a few years before being placed back out on the coral reef. And that's one of our restoration projects. Very much like teaching students about restoration, it gives them hope, it gives them ideas about what can be possible in the future. Here, this is in Palm Beach County. You can see one of my colleagues from Florida Sea Grant. He is working on oyster restoration, and so he has some experimental oyster restoration squares. These are different types of concrete with burlap or um, some of them, I believe, had tire chips, different components in that cement. There's some oyster shells that are placed within those squares. And then we went and we helped place them out in areas that were permitted 
for restoration activities. And so the students were really learning about and being inspired by what they could do on a field trip to help the shoreline area be restored. This is the National Hurricane Center down in Miami on Florida International University's campus. And we are getting ready to watch the launch of a weather balloon at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day. The Hurricane Center launches a balloon. So we went outside, we got to see the balloon be launched. We went back into the National Weather Service and we actually got to see the data that the balloon was collecting as it was going up, up, up into the sky. Here we are on a snorkeling trip in the Florida Keys, learning about water quality sampling. So we had gone and gotten the water to go look at the coral reefs, but then we also sat on the boat. It was, it was a calm enough day that we could do this, and we collected some of the water from the reef, in addition to some of the nearshore water, and we analyzed that using different types of water quality kits to look at salinity and pH, some of that water chemistry I mentioned earlier. We also go to the Eco Discovery Center in Key West, and here you have a representative from the National Park Service, in addition to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and they are teaching the students all about the sanctuary and the way in which the parks, both organizations, work together to manage the reefs in South Florida, all the way out from Key West to Dry Tortugas. And also, um, we have to talk about the bonding. Students are building their professional networks. And through interactions, I know that some of these are somebody who should be familiar to you. If any of you sat in on the lectures yesterday or the, the talk yesterday, one of my former students, she actually presented to the um, this event, the Earth Day, Earth Week event yesterday, but she has a professional network. Through these field trips, she was able to connect with different departments, different organizations, and learn about the potential for jobs in the future, in addition to building experience and meeting and having fun with her peers. So again, that idea of building the next generation of ocean stewards is always on my mind. I'll finish this section with the challenges, is that you know, as a working mother, it's been really tough. I do travel a lot to many different amazing places, but I do have a family. And so there's always some sort of balance with that. And what you see here is a sea lion that we think came from the Galapagos. 1,500 kilometers, it would have traveled to another project site that I work at in Nicaragua, so the Pacific coast of Nicaragua now. But I also try to bring my family with me when we can, but when I can't, it's tough. It's definitely a challenge to be away from my loved ones. One of the other things that I've learned um, is about culture and different ways of life. And what you see here is some of the harpoons that are used to harvest manatees and sea turtles. And the gentleman in the picture on the left-hand side, he actually is the one who, for generations in his family, they are allowed to, by law, harvest sea turtles and manatees because they are an indigenous community on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. And so what we have learned is, or I have learned, is that there are different cultural cultural. Um, belief systems and different values, and it's not hundreds of animals that are taken, but it's one animal that would feed the entire family. It's very, in, um, the structure, I, I just had to learn more about this because I had never seen that before in the United States with so many endangered species and the protections of them. But the uh, autonomous government, they call themselves, located in that area, they decide that there can be some harvesting of some of these species and um, the harpoons in the middle, of course, with how they actually um, remove them. And then on the right hand side, what you see are some sea turtle eggs. So again, poaching and um, that would be considered poaching in Florida, but this is part of the way of life. People do eat sea turtles and they do eat their eggs. So respecting other people and really taking the time to learn about how and why those different cultural values and belief systems exist. It's challenging because it hurts you know, my heart when I see um, some of these sea turtles, but it also is out of the respect for the way in which these indigenous communities have lived for quite some time in this area. My final part to close this out is the advice to young people like yourselves and why you should invest in the planet. So advice first. 
We know you need to be critically thinking all the time. I'm sure your teachers tell you that. And to look at research and science and the information that you're seeing. Check the sources. Make sure that this is good information. Don't be afraid to go and look at some of the data and the analyses that are done and start to form your own opinions. You need to be critically thinking because that's how you come up with the solutions and the strategies to some of the most pressing issues that we have related to our Earth Day themes. Use the scientific method. I am sure that you are covering this. So thanks to those teachers sticking to it. I know it's not always easy, but definitely use the scientific method. Use it for yourself in your personal lives, right? Am I making good choices? Um, but also for any of the research or science, if you choose this field, don't forget to always go back to the scientific method. It's good. It's, it's, it's something that you'll find this curiosity factor if you've got a true or false hypothesis. So don't stop learning. Um, service learning is just get involved wherever you can get involved with activities. So these cleanups that are happening, you know, we have one on Sunday. Any opportunity for you to get out into nature and to really explore who is helping be part of the solution, again, definitely come up with strategies and talk to people. What can you do on your own? What can you do together to make that environmental change? Don't forget to have dreams. I know there's a lot of difficult, uh, lots of challenges with climate change, and we see some of the degradation to our environment, but don't ever stop having dreams and then try to realize those. Figure out the ways. Don't take no for an answer, only if it's not going to hurt you, but try to use your, you know, your critical thinking skills that you've gained over the years to address some of these curious you know, these topics that you've developed through inquiry. And always, always ask questions. So just to cover what we are, just to review what we've covered today, all of these different topics, I encourage you to dive in any opportunity you have. And then for questions, I think we did pretty good on the time, almost to the minute. So I, I, I know the schools are here, I've included them, and then I'll leave you with my contact information. Teachers, don't forget to email me if you would like a book, of the Tropical Connections, a book set for your classrooms. Awesome, that was amazing. Everyone, please join me with a huge round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Really, I'm inspired. I'm, ho I'm sure that all the students are also inspired. And um, if you want to learn more about any events that Fabian Ocean Learning Center is doing throughout the year, please visit this website at www.fabianoceanolc.org. And we'll go ahead and also send that follow-up link as well with also Dr. Fletcher's information. So for my favorite time, it's the Q&A time. Are you guys ready? All right. So this is a time where you all can go ahead and submit your questions. Dr. Fletcher, are you ready to answer some questions? I'm ready to answer questions to you. Thanks. All righty. So please feel free to input some questions that you have on the chat, and we'll go ahead and submit them. So let's see. We're still waiting. So please feel free, teachers, to submit. Okay, we have one. It says here, what happens when one of the wires that the submarine puts down breaks? Mm, that's a great, great question. question. Yeah. So it has to be picked up off the seafloor and fixed. It's not an easy process. Okay. So, yeah, so it's not an easy process. I bet, you know, they have to go down there plan several months i don't know how long it takes but it must be a very <laughs> tedious process um we have another question um the other question that we have here is what is the biggest risk that you've taken about your journey yeah uh, when i look back at some of the places that i have explored at this age now, I, I may not have gone there, uh, but I was too adventurous. So I think the biggest risks, and it's only because now that I'm older and I'm like, I probably shouldn't have been there. A lot of the field experiences that I have from the past, I was in very far, far away places that, you know, there's a lot of what ifs can happen, but I, I wouldn't take them back. 
I would just look at them differently if they were presented in front of me today. Awesome. Awesome. We have another question. We have actually a lot of questions. Uh, so please keep them rolling. So the next question is, how can we improve the health of the coral reef around Florida? Mm -hmm. Get involved. Get involved in research. Get involved in advocacy. There are letter writing campaigns that I have seen youth. I'll just say youth generically because we've got you know elementary through high school. Learn the science. Tropical Connections has a lot of very basic information to help you if you're not familiar with it. But getting involved in the advocacy piece is very important and letting people know that you care about these resources. And then it boils down to everything you do every day. So using less water. Where does your water come from when, you know, don't tell me that if you turn the faucet and it comes out of the faucet. More importantly, where does it go? So whether you're flushing the toilet or it's going down the drain in the shower or your sink, where is that water going? So to be very conscious of what you're doing and there's a local to the global, right, and regional activities that you're involved in. So driving cars versus riding your bike or walking. Awesome. Lots of things that you can do. Awesome. That was great. Actually, I know it's all about taking action and you all are hosting an event on, I believe, next Friday. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so on Arbor Day, to finish out the Earth Month, or nearly finish out the Earth Month, on Friday, April 29th, we have a planting at a restoration site at John Pennekamp Coral Reef State Park. It's actually the Landside Park, so Dagny Johnson. But Gio, that's right, we're going to have a planting where we're putting more trees back into nature, where a project in the, I think it, it, for this particular site, I think it was in the 1950s, somebody wanted to make a big development, put houses and condos there, and they were stopped. The state inherited the property, and so now we're going to do some restoration work there. So if you're interested in joining us, definitely email me about that as well. So we'll also add that information to the email as well. We have right. another question. What is your favorite part of Florida's habitat? So my favorite part is the marine environment. I like to get in the water in the near shore and just look at all the fish and the reef. And, and that would definitely, when it's warm, I don't go in the water when it's cold for sure. Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to just keep the questions going. Again, there's several questions. Have you been injured on the job before? Of course. Anytime you work on boats, something can happen to you. So, uh, Pinching lobsters, they hurt. That Oof. hurts a lot. I've cut myself. I've, I haven't broken any bones, uh, but always cuts, bruises, you name it. It uh, keeps keeps you on your toes, and things can happen really quickly on boats. So you always have to know what's happening around you. Have really good situational awareness. But wouldn't trade that. It's it's exciting. Awesome. Another question: How tall can seagrass grow? Depends which species. What, which species are we talking about? So there's variations. And also we have eelgrass or there's different types of grasses that can grow as you move into the different habitats. So if it's saltier water or it's, if it's brackish or a little bit more fresh water system, the Dallas area gets really, really long and a little curly top on it. So there's many variables that goes into that. Um, another question for you is, have you discovered any new species? I didn't discover them, but I saw them um, on the artificial reefs. Gio, can they see the slide that has my name and contact information on it? No, not right now. Okay, so I was just going to use that one of the corals as an example. So we have an invasive coral that years ago I was diving and I said, that doesn't look normal. It only was growing on artificial reefs. And, and one of my colleagues, he wrote an article about it, but we were diving and I said, oh, not that it was a new species, but that it was an invasive species that was seen here in Southeast Florida. Nice, interesting. Um, we have another question. So have you ever saved an animal and which kind of animal? Oh, lots. Um, everything from um, some fish, sharks being caught on the reef in terrestrial systems, birds. There was a bird the other week that fell out of the nest. So lots uh. of different animals. Not one in particular stands out because for me, they're all important. But wherever I am, if there's an animal 
with uh, an issue and it's not going to hurt me, I will definitely do my best to work with others or by myself if I can handle it uh, to help them out. Awesome. So we have one more question and we'll wrap it up. So the last question is, why are there cables in the ocean? Ah, super question. And I'll kind of revisit the fixing of the cable because I don't know that I gave you exactly what you wanted. So cables, most of the communications, right? We all, I think most of us have cell, cell phones on this uh, webinar, but most of the communications, 99% go through submarine fiber optic cables. I never knew that until I started working for a, a, one of the companies. And eye-opening. I always thought, oh, it's the satellites in the sky, but it is not. And initially, the underwater cables were there for banking, mostly for banking. It's a safer, secure type of system, at least at that time. So we have lots of cables underwater because of communication systems, just direct connections, in addition to if one of the lines gets snapped, like somebody asked our first question, what happens? Do all communications stop? No, there's a backup system, so you can reroute the different, um, the different connections to get from one place to another. It's some redundancy in that as well. And then going back to the, if a cable does get snapped, sometimes fishing boats may drag their nets. And so you do have a cable that gets snapped. You might have an underwater volcano. There might be something that makes that cable move in a way that it does snap. You've got to go, if any of you are, are out on boats, you use a grappling hook, you pick the ends of the cable up and then Depending on how bad the break is, if you can find the, you know, the ends, you always want to find the ends. These systems are very, very expensive. And then you'll go ahead, it'll be brought onto the boat, and it'll be fixed. But it's, it's a very complicated process. It sounds much easier than, than it actually is, but it is quite complicated. Awesome. That was amazing. Everyone, thank you so much for your questions. Remember, tomorrow's another day. So we hope to also get many questions as well. So before we wrap up, we want to encourage you all to also take action. This Sunday, as Dr. Fletcher mentioned, we have a cleanup that's taking place. So who wants to attend this beach cleanup this Sunday? Show of hands. Okay, I see many hands up. So we hope that you all can um, join us. It's going to happen Sunday. Registration starts from 8.30 and the cleanup goes from 9 to 11. It's going to be at Coral Cove Beach. We'll go ahead and send you the information so that you all can sign up. And if you're interested in finding out more information, please visit us at www.weloveyouusa.org. So before we conclude and wrap it up, we just want to say one more thing. So Dr. Fletcher, are you ready? I'm ready, Gio. All right, ready? One, two, three. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you tomorrow for another day in our Earth Week.